This is Ang Pula. This is Bhutan This Week. I'm Chuni Seldon. Let's take a look at our top stories first. His Majesty the King grants an audience to the Director General of Border Roads. And the High Court orders the Office of Attorney General to continue prosecuting Foreign Minister Rinzin Dorji in the Lhaka Karpo case. His Majesty the King granted an audience to the Director General of Border Roads, Lieutenant General Rakesh Mohan Mittal. Lieutenant General R.M. Mittal joined the Indian Army in 1977 and has handled many important command and staff appointments. He is also a recipient of presidential awards of Ati Vishesh Seva, Vishesh Seva and Sena medals. The concession agreement for Bhutan Education City project between the former government and Infinity and Infrastructure Leasing and Financial Services, the two project developers, is being terminated. The Works and Human Settlement Minister, Doji Choden, who is also the chairperson of the Bhutan Education City project, said that the government, after negotiations, has agreed to pay 99.38 million newton to the project developers as reimbursement. The developers has claimed more than 163 million newton as their investment for the project so far. About 479 million newton was allocated for the infrastructure development of the project. The government closed down the project as it was in violation with the Land Act. Limpudoji Choden said once the project is contractually and legally closed, government will decide on how the project area will be used. Speculation has it that the Business Opportunity and Information Center may be dissolved soon or it may be merged with the Bhutan Development Bank. The government, on the other hand, says that it has not made any concrete decisions yet. The cabinet recently directed the Finance Ministry and the Economic Affairs Ministry to review the criticism against BOIC and decide accordingly. Speaking to BBS, the finance minister said that the government still believes that BOIC was established legitimately and with a good intention to boost the country's economy. The government has directed the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Economic Affairs to look into it and then come out with a recommendation for the government to take a decision. And basically, I think government wants to know where government has gone wrong and why people seem to have a lot of criticism on BOIC. Criticism on BOIC has been a never-ending discussion, even before its formation. Why today? Why is the government reconsidering or considering the need to study the status of BOIC. So that's why the uh, cabinet has directed the Minister of Finance and Minister of Economic Affairs to review this and find out why people are actually criticizing and uh, uh, why on several occasions that, uh, that this discussion came in the National Assembly and National Council. So on the submission of the recommendation, joint recommendation by Minister of Finance and Minister of Economic Affairs, we will have the answer to this. Yes, but there is not a pinch of regret the government is feeling today uh, for having, uh, saying that it is, the government doesn't think that it's, it is a mistake. Not at all, because uh, government at the time of instituting this uh, BIC, well, we had a good intention. When you say the Ministry of Economic Affairs and your ministry, which is the Finance Ministry, is working to study the uh, feasibility of whether to allow BOIC to remain as it is or whether to dissolve it or merge it, what are some of the options that the government is thinking of, like merging it with BDPL, as people speculate? I think let's leave it to the wisdom of the uh, task force or the committee who will come up as of now since... Uh, People have not uh, actually worked on the, uh, or people have just started on the review of this uh, uh, BOIC. 
I'll have no answer or I'll have, uh, I, I don't want to conclude anything. But Limpo, the Prime Minister Lynchin uh, has said that the government is ready to shut down BOIC. Should it be proven illegal? As of now, at least for the government, we are clear that uh, it is very much legal. And because of the fact that the Prime Minister loud and clear admitted that in case or should there be any uh, question of legitimacy, we are ready to, uh, ready to close down. It is because of that fact the government or the cabinet has directed MOIC and uh, Minister of Economic Affairs to review this. So uh, we will now see and then uh, the task force will come up with the recommendation. So at that point of time, the cabinet will, uh, the cabinet will discuss what would be the course of or what would be the fate of BOIC. Should the BOIC be uh, dissolved or merged with any other institution, what, it, what happens to the employees, the current employees of BOIC? That's what will definitely come up with the recommendation. So the, I think we should uh, leave it to the recommendation of the task force that, need, that will be ultimately put up to the government. Bhutan now officially has 103 tigers, up from 75 in 1998. It was found after the 2014 to 2015 nationwide tiger survey in the country. The survey was conducted entirely by a team of Bhutanese nationals. The survey was revealed in the capital to, the, to commemorate the Global Tiger Day. Bhutan is one of the 13 countries in the world where tigers can still be found roaming in the wild. The Department of Forest and Park Services carried out the nationwide revalidation survey of tigers from March 2014 to March 2015. Over 1,000 camera stations were set up to monitor the tigers. The Prime Minister said increasing number of tigers in a small country like ours is very achieving. <laughs> Animchi, Dun Tunkuchigi Nankunalu, Anebe Yafaju Bodalu, Nami Sami, Nierandi Yu, Sishuni, then Acheregi Gakap Naludi, the Genzeta, Janka, Animchi Du, say, the Teddy Baribe, Kunkesumidi, then Acheregi Dubagi, Shipchi Bedigibe, Kunkemidilu, then Achikara, the Nami Sami, Yi Rangu di Bombere Yu, Sishuni. The Prime Minister also launched the Bhutan Forest and Wildlife Enforcement Database of the Department of Forest and Park Services. It is an online application system of reporting on illegal wildlife trade occurring within the country. Dikilhamo, BBS News. Despite a meeting with the members of parliament, officials from the Works on Human Settlement and Election Commission, people of Wonchang Geok in Paro, will appeal to the parliament regarding the Dongkak's Tomde demarcations. The meeting was conducted on Friday. Officials said the meeting was to clarify the misinformation created by the media. In the meeting, the Election Commission clarified that the information on media about Paro Zongkak losing two of its geoks to the Zongkak Tomde was wrong. Three geoks from Hongril Geok and all five geoks from Wanja Geok have areas which are demarcated under the Tomde boundary. But this doesn't mean that the entire geoks will get fully absorbed by the Tomde. Portion of the geoks in terms of both land and people will still remain as part of geoks. So we can say for sure that these two geoks will not disappear. Officials from the Ministry of Works and Human Settlement also clarified on the allegation that the demarcation map approved and sent by the Zongkak Tsogdu was not presented in the parliament. They said three maps were presented to the parliament. The reason why we presented three maps was because earlier during the two-day parliamentary session, Paro's Tomde plan could not be approved. So we received orders from the assembly to send three maps. Two of the maps were received from the Zongkak and the third map had included Rimpung and Tazong as per the orders. He also assured that people will not be losing their wetlands to developmental activities. 
The ministry is working on a valley development plan which will ensure the protection of those wetlands. However, at the end of the meeting, people still stood firm with their earlier decision to appeal to the parliament. <laughs> National Assembly's Deputy Speaker Shimi Doji, who chaired the meeting, said if people appeal, the discussion over the issue could take place probably in the winter session. Now, if they send an appeal letter, first it will be discussed in the preliminary meeting. Members from both the ruling and opposition parties will sit down together and discuss if the issue does warrant to be discussed again in the parliament. If it is passed, the discussions will start from the beginning. People of Wancha Georg said they will appeal with a signed petition sent through the Zonkak administration. For Ishigetse in Paro, Sonomongdi, PBS News. Lenchen Tsering Topke graced the groundbreaking ceremony of the Tamchu Ha Link Road. The Tamchu Ha Link Road is an alternate alignment connecting Ha with Finsling Thimpu Highway. Cabinet Ministers, Director General of Indian Border Roads, the Indian Ambassador to Bhutan and Members of Parliament were also present during the ceremony. Once the construction of the road is complete, the travel time from Finsoling to Ha is expected to be reduced by two hours. The length of the link road will be 12.8 km and a 200 meter span bridge will also be constructed at a cost of 335 million The Damchu Ha link road is going to benefit us economically, but it is going to benefit us strategically as well. Because this road and the bridge, the 200 meter bridge, span bridge, is going to provide an alternate bridge and an alternate road to the important valley and the airport in Faro. Project Dantak is undertaking the construction of the road at an estimate cost of 852 million gitam. The construction of the road will be completed within three years. Later, Lynchen also visited the ongoing Damchu Chuka Bypass Road. Compiled for Tsiringzam, Sonomongdi for BBS News. People using the East-West Highway say that they are facing problems with the new roadblock timing. It has been about two weeks since the new timing along the route was introduced by the Department of Roads. With the new timing, bus drivers said they have to wait for at least three hours at the blocks. Earlier, they had to wait for about an hour only. For the passengers traveling to east, they said it is difficult to find an accommodation in Bumtang. By the time they reach, it is already late. There are so many blocks on the way. As soon as the bus reaches the site, they block the way and start working. We passengers don't even get time to eat lunch properly or use the toilets. There is also a huge chance of accident as buses rush when the block is open and presently the road condition is very bad. When we rush to get through the block on time, there are chances of accidents. I don't know with whom they consulted for this new timing. We drivers and passengers do not get enough time to sleep. We have to leave early the next day according to the RSTA timing. When we reach late, it is difficult to start early the next day. It is inconvenient for the drivers.
Even if we are late by a minute, they do not let us pass. When the block time is over, they delay by over half an hour. There have been continuous announcements from BBS that people should not travel at night on these roads, but we have no option than traveling late at night. Bus drivers added that they also do not get time to carry out minor maintenance of the buses. They have to wait the longest at Nubding and Rabuna blocks in Wandipodang. The chief engineer from the Department of Roads in Lobisa, GM Rai, said the timing was changed in consultation with RSTA and traffic officials. It was changed following the change in location of the widening works. The chief engineer said it would be difficult to reschedule the timing as per the convenience of those using the route. However, if the situation is grave, he said bus drivers should jointly ride to the department to work out a convenient timing. Compiled for Komal Kharka in Bumtang, Tenzin Doji, PBS News. The High Court orders the Office of Attorney General to continue prosecuting Foreign Minister Rinzin Dorji in the Lhaga Karpo case. The order was issued on Tuesday. The court also asked OAG to submit grounds of appeal within 10 days from the issuance of the order. The order was issued after ACC submitted that the case will be prosecuted by them during the show cause hearing on Monday. However, High Court overruled the submission saying that functions and constitutional roles of the OAG and ACC should not be intermixed since OAG is a prosecuting agency while ACC is an investigating agency. But ACC would be eligible to take over the prosecution case only if the case is delayed without valid reasons, manipulated or hampered by interference. The Attorney General Cheryl Hindu said they respect the order issued by the court and is grateful for settling down the institutions. The government could lose a revenue amounting to more than 47 billion new term as a result of extension of completion date of Punasanchu 1 hydropower project. The completion date is now 2019. Besides, it could also increase the price of electricity as interest continue to accumulate during the time. An increase in interest would mean higher debt obligation and higher cost of construction. Since electricity price is computed on cost plus model, it would increase the price of electricity. The extension of the completion period will also affect government's planned activity and projects. A senior government official requesting anonymity said it could affect government's revenue stream since most of the planned projects are based on Bunazangchu's revenue. The new extension deadline would mean the project would only be complete during the next government's tenure. This would mean the present government's revenue would be restricted and the government would have to mobilize its resources from other sources. Managing director of Punasangchu Hydropower Project, Arun Kazanchi, said it cannot be considered revenue loss as it was the same amount of income being deferred to a different date. He said the plant would run for 35 years and even if the project was complete in 2019, it will earn the government the same amount of revenue. Only the time was being delayed. Punazangchu 1 hydropower project is being built at a 40% grant and 60% loan at an interest rate of 10% payable over a period of 12 years from the date of commissioning. Nirub Gelsen for BBS News. A farmer's vegetable group in Ramjar Gyog in Tashiansi has been successful in commercializing vegetable cultivation. The group markets thousands of kilograms of vegetables every year, bringing huge income to the members. Of the eight geoks in Tashiansi Zongkok, farmers in Ramjar Geok grow all kinds of vegetables. Just like potatoes, they also grow vegetables in large quantity for commercial purpose. It is their main source of income. Through their group, the farmers supply vegetables to different places. Before, we used to cultivate maize, but wild boars prevent it from growing. Now we grow potatoes, but this year we did not have a good harvest because of the wild boars. After potatoes, we grow all kinds of vegetables and we sustain through that. Here at Gyumba, we depend on vegetables. The group, Tsangrong Potato and Vegetable Group, has 15 members, all of them in Upper Ramjar, Gimpa. 
The group markets more than 20 tons or 20,000 kilograms of vegetables annually to different places like Tashigong, Nganglam, Diwatang, Bongtar and Samdipjongkar towns. Despite the success, human-wildlife conflict, however, is the biggest challenge at the moment. We have 15 members in the group and we all depend on vegetables. Wild animals, mainly wild boar, monkey and porcupine, attack our crops. They dig our vegetables and eat everything and they don't even leave the fruits on the trees. Through the sale of vegetables alone, the group members earn a minimum of 70 to 80,000 newtum annually. They also earn over 100,000 newtum through the sale of potatoes. We have been working hard on growing vegetables and we will still be doing the same. For instance, me as the chairman of the group, I always tell my colleagues that we have to work even harder and they are also very hardworking. The minimum they earn is 100,000 meter in a year from potato alone and we support our families through this. The group members also grow vegetables during the winter but for only self-consumption currently. But in the future, they hope to commercialize the vegetable cultivation even during the winter. Cheche, BBS News, Konglung. Much to the disappointment of cordycep collectors in Sefu Gyog and Wandi Poda, this year the yield has not been as good as the last season. The Agriculture and Forest Ministry recently conducted the cordycep auction for the Gyog. <laughs> As the bidders quoted their price, villagers eagerly waited in hope of fetching a better price. This time, the highest quoted price was 1.4 million gitam for a kilogram of the best quality cordyceps. Officials from the Agriculture and Forest Ministry say the quality of cordyceps this time is as good as last year's. Over 67 kilograms of cordyceps were auctioned at Sepu this season. However, Cordyceps collector said the yield is lesser compared to the previous years. The number of collectors increases every year. So when unauthorized people come to collect, they dig the ground in the process of searching. I think that when they do so, for at least five years, the cordyceps do not sprout again from that place. So that is why the yield is declining. Compared to last year, the harvest was very poor this time. Last year, we collected at least 80 to 150 pieces in a day, but this year we hardly got 30 to 40 pieces. With lesser yield, there were lesser buyers. This has also affected those who set up stalls in the area solely for the auction time. There were over a hundred stalls selling goods ranging from household items to clothing at the auction site. For Sujaman Thapa in Tongsa, Sonomongdi, PBS News. That's all we have for you this week. Thank you for joining us. This is Shoni Seldon saying goodbye and you take care.